Today I'm going to talk about a sliding chain that you see over here over a table with friction. So there is friction on the table. There's also gravity and because there is gravity the chain if it hangs over a sufficient amount will start accelerating downwards. Okay. I'm going to solve this using the Lagrangian method. So the first step we need to go through is find out what the generalized coordinates will be. And there's essentially only one coordinate. So I set x equals 0 over here when the chain is at L minus L0 on the table and L0 off the table. Yes, yeah, so the total length of the chain is L. And the generalized coordinate is essentially set as x, so it will follow the movement of the chain while it's falling downwards under the influence of gravity. Okay, so we have an x, and of course for the infinitesimal displacement we have a dx, or a delta x. There is one generalized force as a second step, because there is friction. And a generalized force really depends on how much of the chain is on the table. The more of the chain that is on the table, the more friction there is, because there's more mass on the table. Okay, so usually the friction is a, is a portion of the normal force, right? And so the normal force in this case is exactly the same as the gravitational force downwards. So it's m times g downwards, and there's the normal force which, which is m times g upwards, times mu is the non-conservative force over here. And that's what we calculate here in the generalized force. So we have an m that depends on the position x. And what is that m? That m is a, which is the cross section of the chain, times the length of the chain, and that varies, that's l minus l0 at time t is 0, minus x if x starts moving, so if x goes up, this distance becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and that makes sense, and therefore also the opposing force, the friction force, will be uh, reduced, right? It will be less negative. So it will be A times this length, which is the volume, times rho, the density, and it is assumed that the density of the chain is constant over the whole chain, times G, times the mu, and the mu is the friction coefficient, okay? And if you multiply all that with dx, you essentially have your uh, virtual work here. Okay? And from there you can extract the generalized force out of it, and that is essentially just this piece here. And that's what's been given here. Okay? So you can see that the generalized force really depends on x. If x goes up, this will be smaller and smaller and smaller, which makes sense because there's less contact with the surface and therefore less friction. Okay? So the second step is to go calculate the Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian again is built up out of two pieces. It's T minus V, it's a kinetic piece, minus a potential piece. So the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. That's where the uh, Lagrangian consists of. Let's start with the kinetic energy. And if you look at the kinetic energy of the whole system, it's essentially the mass of the whole thing times a half times V squared. So a half times the mass of the chain times V squared. What is the mass of the chain? That's rho times L times A again, right? The length of the chain times the cross-sectional area, which is the volume of the chain times the density of the chain, gives you the mass of the chain. Okay, so it's a half, essentially a half MV squared. And of course, the V is the X dot the generalized coordinate we chose before. Now let's take a look at the potential. The potential energy is essentially the amount, it's, it's m, which again depends on x, times g, times the height that the potential energy will move. Now this is somewhat tricky, but you have to look at the center of mass here, of course. Right? And the center of mass, when x equals 0, is essentially L0 over 2. So that's where the center of mass is. So if you then look how much it will move, if it move, moves x in addition to the L0, 
it's essentially L0 plus X divided by 2 because the center of mass moves by a factor of uh, the, a division of a factor of 2 and not just L0 plus X, right? It's only half of that that it moves. So that is M times G times the movement, which is L0 plus X over 2. And the mass of the chain piece that moved is of course L0 plus X in this case and not divided by 2, it's the whole thing because that's the whole thing that moved over the edge, it moved X downwards essentially. So it's L0 plus X times Rho times A. If you fill that out you get for the potential energy minus Rho times A times G L0 plus X squared over 2. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so now we have an ability to just calculate the Lagrangian by subtracting T minus V. So you get this term minus this term, which becomes a plus. And here you have your total Lagrangian again. Okay, so now we can actually derive the equations of motion by using Lagrange's equation. So again, I copied the Lagrangian over here. I copied the generalized force, with, which is the friction force, the non-conservative force over here. And we're going to use that and plug that into the Lagrangian equation, the Euler-Lagrange equation over here. Now there's only one generalized variable, so you only have to differentiate towards x dot in this case. So let's start with that. If you do that, you get rho times L times A times x dot. The 2 uh, is eliminated by this 2. And you differentiate that once towards time and you get rho times l times a times x double dot over here okay minus the lagrangian towards x differentiated so you since there's only one x dependency in the lagrangian you differentiate this component towards x and you get rho times a times g times l zero plus x right simply differentiating and that's equal to the non-conservative force over here so now we're almost at the equation of motion, okay? So we simplify this a little bit by dividing out rho and r, which is common in all components, so that disappears, and you can see that over here. And I also moved this piece to the other side, okay? And made it a plus, and that's the term you see here. Now I divide it by L, and I cleaned it up a little bit. I I essentially collected the axis and I collected the rest and you get an expression like this. And this is simply a second order linear differential equation as you can see. There's an x double dot here, there's an x and there's a con some sort of constant over here and that equals zero. So this can easily be calculated and a solution can be generated. <clears throat> if there's a need for people to see how that's done in general, um, I can do a video on that with these linear differential equations, but I assume it is known how to do that, who to go from the, how to go from this line, linear second order differential equation with these initial conditions that I took to this equation over here. So what I essentially took is that x at zero is zero. So that means that the chain is exactly like it is, you see it here at t is zero. And there's also no speed at t is zero. So it's at rest. So you, you have to hold it, for instance with your finger, you hold it and at t is zero you let it go and then it starts to accelerate, okay? Due to gravity. So there's enough chain here hanging that it overcomes the friction force over here so that it can start accelerating. If that's not the case, if there's only a little piece, it will just keep at rest and nothing happens. But in this case it does happen and that means that this force due to uh, the gravity and the mass of this piece here that's bigger than the friction force over here, so it overcomes the, uh, the friction and it will start accelerating, okay? I plugged in some numbers to get a little feel for how it works. I plugged in G is 10, L equals 1, so the total chain length is a meter, L0 is 0.3 meters, so that's this piece. And the friction uh, coefficient is, is also 0.3. If you do that, you see that it starts at 0.3, it's hard to see, but this is 0.3 here, okay? And then it starts accelerating over time. This is your time axis over here, and this is your x. But my x is not this x, but it is the tip 
of this chain here, over here. That is what I'm following. So at t is zero, it's already at 0.3 meters, and this is now my zero point. Now you can use obviously the same equation, because it's one chain, so the way it moves here, it will also move here. There's no difference. So I used x is zero over here, and it starts at 0.3 as a consequence, because L0 is 0 0.3. And then it starts to accelerate. This is the line L equals one. So as soon as the whole chain is at one meters, it starts at 0.3, so it has to fall 0.7 meters, which is exactly this piece here. If that's the case, then this equation is no longer valid, right? So this piece, which is cosine hyperbolic, is not valid. You can take that out, but this piece is all accurate. And after that, when the chain is totally vertical here, it just follows the normal uh, quadratic equation, okay, of a mass that falls with an initial speed at the point where uh, and you can calculate that speed based on the position here and you differentiate you get the speed and you can calculate the speed when the whole chain is vertically and that's the initial speed and then it will just follow a quadratic equation so this is a cosine hyperbolic equation but after that point here it will follow a quadratic equation of course and not the hyperbolic okay I think this is really cool that you can calculate all this of course, it's a very simplified model, right? The chain, of course, is considered, uh, there's no friction inside the chain and it's very easy to bend it, etc. But apart from these things, I think it's a really cool example. Um, I think it's a great place to stop now. So if you like this video, please like and please subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.